All right, next book that we're going to analyze in our series is the excellent book Byzantine Theology by John Meindorf. Father Meindorf was a premier Orthodox theologian and Byzantine student, Byzantinist of the 20th century. And in this book, you're going to hear mostly the stuff that you hear me say. So we're not going to be speculating. We're really just going to be repeating and giving the arguments that many of the Orthodox theologians of the 20th century have laid out. We've covered Lossky's books. We've covered um, a lot of different texts that are, uh, you know, pretty much premier examples of orthodoxy and this is one of the best that I found in fact there's a lot of things that make this in ways even better than Lossky not to detract from mystical theology or image and likeness which we've done talks on or dogmatic theology but there's a lot of history that comes up in this text that makes it a perfect blend of church history and orthodox theology and again a lot of the critiques of originism the critiques of absolute and simplicity the critiques of um, Latin theology, papalism, all the things that you hear me say come up in this book. So this is going to be a brief kind of overview of the book for 10, 15, 20 minutes. And then if you want the full analysis, you'll have to subscribe to Jay's analysis in the links below. Um, but really he begins the, the text by talking about the distinction between East and West and that really the Byzantine spirit is what characterizes Orthodox Christianity. And the Latin uh, tradition goes in a different route, especially when we get to the Frankish period. So that's really the beginning of the rift. There's obviously theological predecessors to the rift, to the split in the Latin theology, in the uh, Augustinian theology that leads to Thomism and so forth down the road. But he says that we can really look at the Council of Trollo, the Quintessex Council, that it wasn't accepted in the West, although it is accepted by the Seventh Ecumenical Council. <clears throat> and he says that a couple things we can look at are things like how we view Revelation, how the noose is viewed, the doctrine of the noose, um, that Orthodox theology doesn't posit a evolution of theology and evolution of dogma. Uh, he covers this on page eight. And so this will lead eventually to different traditions of how to read scripture, different traditions of um, really different presuppositions than the West, is what he argues on page 8. And he will note the, the Barleamite views of the West, presuppositions of Barleam. He will say that um, Orthodox theology, when it's said to be mystical, this does not exclude intellectual theology. And that's an important point. And so direct perception of the noose is not against rational theology. It's just a higher, more direct, better experience than through intellect or the limitations of intellect. And he says that another way to look at the distinction between East and West is the fact that Orthodox theology's saints have a unified experience. Right? We don't have all of these different wild experiences of mystics and histrionics and people carving Jesus' name into their chest like Roman Catholic saints. We don't have the stigmata and all this kind of stuff, which is all pre -lest. In our view, we have the same experience, the same um, preference of the experience of God in a unifying sense over abstractions, over intellectualized theology. doesn't mean that we don't do theology in an intellectual or scholastic way. The problem is not being scholastic, it's scholasticism. And so we don't have new dogmas, we don't have evolution of dogma, and there's no tension between dogmatics and the mystical. It's a big, big point in Orthodox theology, which begins with apophaticism, and the essence energy distinction is a necessary corollary to the, to the uh, uh, apophatic view of God. If you believe in apophatic theology, you have to believe in the essence energy distinction. There's really no way to cut that. And the earliest formulations of this are the Cappadocians. Obviously, there's previous versions in St. Paul, but he makes the argument of origins, absolute divine simplicity doctrine being essentially the same as Neoplatonism. And within a few pages, right, he makes the absolute divine simplicity critiques that you hear me make. He moves on to talk about the uh, importance of St. Justinian and the Fifth Council. 
and how St. Justinian is really a crusader against Platonism and the Platonizing of the church. He shut down the Platonic academies, and he didn't allow Platonism to dictate theology. St. Justinian was a crusader in this regard, and he notes that for Orthodox theology, for the Byzantium, the Bible was not a, an ap academic text. It was not taken out of the context of the church. The Bible was always seen to be a liturgical document. Again, arguments you hear me make. However, the typology and the biblical texts uh, in terms of the different schools of the Alexandrian and the Antiochene schools can't be set against one another in the sense of the Orthodox conception affirms the literal, literal historical meaning as well as the allegorical mystical meaning. And you need both of those. Again, a point that you've heard me say. So Christian philosophy, you could say, is a biblical philosophy versus the unbiblical philosophy of Hellenism, which oftentimes confuses the balance between the one and the many. So, so he makes those arguments on pages 24 and 25. Origen, he says, goes too far and contradicts biblical revelation with his philosophical Neoplatonic systems. The Origenist problem, is the same as the divine simplicity problem, leads to eternal creation. Right? It makes the God as Father identical to God's divine essence, and if the Father is the divine essence, and they're identical, then being a Father is also eternal, and is also the same as being Creator, and so there has to be a creation over which God is eternally Father. This is, he says, is origin uh, uh, rejecting the Bible, contradicting the Bible, and it leads to weird doctrines. It leads to uh, monism or absolute mind simplicity. It leads to dyadism or a dyad. <clears throat> he makes that argument on page 26. God, he says, in, in reality is multiple without losing his unity. This is page 27, and these are basic arguments that go back to Dionysius, right? The God of Dionysius, he says, is not the one of the Platonists or Plotinus. Right? God is both one and many in the sense of multiple hypostases and in the sense of distinct energies. These are, these are arguments made on page 28 and 29. And again, he's just laying down that, that groundwork that you hear me talk about so much. In the next chapter, he moves to talk about Christology, and you know he makes some really fundamental points about the Fifth Council really solidifying the Kyrillian interpretation of Chalcedon. Right, um, the Fifth Council rejected the uh, Antiochene interpretation of the hypostatic union, and it affirms the one divine subject in Christ. This isn't even really in dispute. If you read Kenneth Wesha's book. He says the exact same thing. In fact, the whole book is dedicated to that, as well as the Edict of Justinian. There's some interesting arguments made, too, about the energies as uh, essentially signifiers of the divine nature. And so there's a, the essence energy distinction, he says, is crucial to Christology. In fact, the Eucharist, the doctrine of the Eucharist, and our Eucharistic liturgies disprove Protestantism and, and show us that the church of the ancient period did not believe anything close to Protestant penal substitution doctrine. Icons, he says, also prove personhood. They prove the divine person of the Logos because in all iconography, there's the, the, the presupposition, the distinction between nature, person, will, and energy in God. This is directly connected to our iconography doctrine. The Eucharist, therefore, is not a symbol, and icons are not merely symbols. Rather, they teach us the doctrine of God's imminent present in the presence in the world via his energies, and once again, the Platonism of the iconoclasts, literally they were Platonists, the Platonism of their doctrine of the Lord's Supper, all of which are condemned as Hellenism in the Synodicon. And so he notes that the Synodicon of Orthodoxy really reaffirms that multiple condemnation of origin, Neoplatonism, Aristotelianism, right, Platonic ideas, right, across the board. The rejection of Hellenism on pages 63 and 64 is the rejection of Platonism, the rejection of Aristotelianism, foolish opinions, uh, and Origenism as well. Then he moves on to talk about uh, that monastic theology is what dominated in Byzantium. And the, the, the deification that we partake of proves the essence energy distinction to be real. If it's not a real distinction, then we're not really partaking of the uncreated grace. 
right? We don't partake of God's essence. So there has to be a real distinction between what we partake of and what God is in himself. Is the participation real or only virtual, right? So this itself refutes the argument made by the Roman, Roman Catholics and the Thomists about participation. And it also shows uh, that the argument you've heard me make, that the Sixth Council teaches the essence inner distinction, is an argument that Palamas himself makes. Right? This is, this is uh, discussed on page 77. In the section on ecclesiology, you get a lot of the arguments that you hear me make about Christology, about the councils, about the canons. Um, Platonism, again, is condemned in the fact that the canons condemn John Italos. So all forms of Hellenism and Platonism are condemned when the Synodicon of Orthodoxy condemns uh, John Italos and his Hellenizing. And then we get to papal questions, right, about St. Photius, the Filioque, the Mystagogy, Pope John VIII, right, and the issues of John Beccos. This leads to the doctrine of Blackernay, the Palamite Synods, and the rejection of the Council of Lyons and ultimately the Council of Florence. Um, we know that the Spirit, uh, he says, has his being and his existence from the Father alone. And, and this becomes the Orthodox doctrine. Lyons and Florence end up following the train of Augustine. And he notes as well on page 94-95 that Frankish missionaries, the Franks, were responsible for evangelizing Western lands with the Filioque. He also talks about the encounter with the West, the attempts at reconciliation at uh, Florence, which he does, he treats that uh, very well and then we get to the doctrine of prayer and liturgy which is a good chapter and the doctrine of creation and he begins the doctrine of creation making the argument that you've heard me make from the Florovsky essay on Athanasius and creation which is that you have to make a distinction between different types of uh, acts in God at, at intra and at extra right so there's a difference between proceeding right and and generating Right. So those are two distinct acts in God, ad intra, and there are distinctions in God ad extra as well. Right? There's a difference between God's eternal love right, and the action of creating the world. This is an argument that's brought up very clearly here to refute originism and ultimately to refute the Arians. This becomes a central key of debate between them, between Athanasius and the Arians, right? Uh, there's a good section kind of just kind of introducing the Logi doctrine of St. Maximus on pages 132, uh, 131, 132. Um, the doctrine of creation is a unique revealed doctrine. Uh, it's essentially the, the opposite of the Neoplatonic doctrine of emanation, uh, the impersonalism of Neoplatonism, right? Really good chapters from my end work there. Um, the Christology chapter, or excuse me, the person of Christ is a good chapter because it deals with a lot of confusion that people have about um, how to understand the Old Testament, right? The Old Testament is not to be understood in a Marcionite sense where we reject it, we say it was a different God or something like that. Rather, um, the continuity between the Old and the New is centered around the person of Christ. The Old Testament is full of those uh, types, allegories, and symbols, and, and prophetic predictions, Messianic prophecies that predict the coming of Christ. He also notes that there is in St. Maximus and in Orthodox theology a cosmic scope recapitulation, the cosmic scope of Christ's incarnation and redemption that's missing in the West. And so fundamental to uh, Orthodox theology and to St. Maximus is the issue of synergy, right? For man to participate in theosis requires that man has his own will and energy that synergizes with God's divine power, will, and energy. So there's a there's a synergism that is never replaced by Calvinism or monoenergism or monergism. He moves on in the Jesus Christ chapter on pages 144, excuse me, 154, 155 uh, on to the end of the chapter to discuss various Christological errors, heresies, and mistakes. Particularly, he points out that the fourth council defended the two natures in Christ. And so in the sense of the entitative sense of hypostasis, Christ is one being, one particular incarnate being right one holistic unified being sure but the hypostasis of christ strictly speaking according to the fifth council is eternal it's from all eternity and so when he became incarnate we know he's he underwent no change as our doctrine and liturgy says he underwent no change because the he that is present there is the second person of the godhead who assumed human nature 
And so the, the fifth council under Justinian rejects the doctrine that there is a created hypostasis in Christ. There's not. The humanity of Christ has no hypostasis of its own. It's inhypostatized in the person of the Logos who assumed it. The human nature is referred to as an it because in itself, considered in itself, it is impersonal, but it becomes personalized by virtue of the Logos who assumed it. So that's all that composite hypostasis means, and that's precisely how Meyendorf explains it, as well as almost all Orthodox theologians who touch on this issue. Composite hypostasis means that the he who unites the two natures possesses two natures, right? The hypostasis itself, according to Uvesha, according to the Fifth Council, St. Justinian, the Edict, all of Vesha's notes, and here, uh, according to uh, Meyendorf, is an affirmation that the Fifth Council affirms that the Antiochene reading of Chalcedon, that he's purely synthetic, a purely that the hypostasis is only strictly synthetic, is rejected. That's a heretical teaching. He moves on to talk about other uh, heresies that relate to Christology, the Atharthodakate, which is the idea that Christ wasn't fully human, um, he talks about the iconographic argument that St. Theodore the Studite makes about how there's one divine hypostasis and that this is actually proven in iconography because the icons don't present or picture the triad or the divine essence. They pick out and picture the divine hypostasis of the Logos. That's a key argument in St. Theodore's treatise, and that's the argument adopted at the Seventh Council. In fact, he even says that this is proven by the fact that the one who is is not an impersonal force or anything abstract, but is he, it is Yahweh. Yahweh is he and is a personal God. It's the argument Maximus makes, or excuse me, uh, St. Gregory Paulus makes in the triads. He did not say it was it, right? He said, I am he. He did not say I am it, I am he. He goes on to say that the iconographic argument proves there's no human hypostasis in Christ. The Logos is the hypostasis of the flesh. The flesh has no hypostasis of its own. Victory of Christ over death, resurrection, right? all of these things. Christ as the universal man and his divine person are all proven by the fact that he was resurrected from the dead. Right? Uh, the fact that he is resurrected, the fact that Mary is the Theotokos shows that he is the divine person. That's the only way that we can be saved is if the second person of the Godhead assumes human nature. And he assumed, he assumed universal human nature in his single divine hypostasis. And he could only do that if he's a divine person. To say that he's a divine person, by the way, is not to deny his full humanity, but it is to deny that there's a created hypostasis in Christ. Absolutely. And that's specifically the error that the Fifth Council calls out and rejects. We also have uh, excellent statements about the triune God, the Trinity, right? In chapter 14, he talks about how we have a, the correct order of theology, the order of theologia, by rejecting the Western Augustinian approach of speculating about essence first, but rather beginning with the personhood of the Father, the monarchia of the Father, which is the sole cause, beginning, starting point of all of our theology and the whole Godhead. This is all made on page 181, 2, 3, 4. Everything you hear me say is right here in this book. In fact, he says that when we understand person, one thing that was a unique aspect to Christian revelation and Christian theology was that person no longer just was an individual, right? That's the closest approximation that Aristotelian philosophy could give to what a person was, or just an individual object or uh, uh, substance. Now, person takes on the, the role of subject, agent, or personal cause in the sense of a, a, an inner consciousness more than just an instantiation of nature. And that's how we can have a real distinction between the Father and the Son and the Spirit because they're not just instantiations of the divine nature. They're also really, truly distinct personal, um, distinct type of stasis, distinct persons. And thus, the Father being the sole cause is the beginning point of all Trinitarian theology not the divine essence. We don't begin our theology with speculation about the divine essence. Then he goes on to talk about other problems in Latin theology um, and how uh, the, the monarchy of the Father doctrine really solves a lot of those problems and that um, 
the eunomian doctrine is what really is uh, the characteristic of the West, where the Latin West failed to understand the real distinction between essence and energy, and so this led them into eunomianism, and Thomism and Augustinianism are unfortunately repeating a lot of the errors and mistakes, and he again goes into critiquing the absolute divine simplicity position of the West, and he points out that Palamas's position is definitely different from Augustine. There's not any question about that. The Roman Catholic Church, loosely speaking, adopts the Augustinian views and positions. The Augustinian triad is contrary and different to the Cappadocian doctrine of the triad. And he says that this results in created grace, right? Augustine does teach created grace. This is a problem there at that time. <clears throat> And the orthodox position is that just as there's a real distinction between nature and person, so there's a real distinction between essence and energy, and between the energies amongst themselves. And he even has citations from the medieval uh, Palamite synods, the uh, anti akandinos uh, uh, statements that affirm the distinctions and differences amongst the energies. I am he does not mean I am essence, St. Gregory Palamas says, and that's a reference to triads 3 Point two, point twelve. <clears throat> so that's the preeminent preeminence of personhood in Orthodox Christian revealed theology that makes it different from the abstract speculations and impersonalism of Hellenism. And he goes on to conclude that uh, the 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 work in relation to antinomies. Right? You've heard me talk about logical antinomies and how Orthodox theology doesn't have a problem accepting logical antinomies. And that's distinct from contradictions. Because Trinitarian theology will, will involve logical antinomies. And most heretics, right, they fall into the mistake of thinking that uh, distinction entails division, right? They, they don't read, they don't know what catapanoia means. They never read Dr. Bradshaw's essays on catapanoia explaining how something can be a conceptual distinction and a real distinction, or perhaps just a conceptual distinction. There's different types of distinctions, especially into medieval theology. So if you want the full treatment of John Mayendorf's Byzantine theology, you can subscribe below at Jay's Analysis. Thank you.